Welcome everyone to Connected Learning uh, TV. I'm Craig Watkins, uh, Principal Investigator in the Connected Learning Research Network and part of the team at Connected Learning TV. For those watching either on live stream or the recording of this webinar, uh, today's conversation is actually part of a, um, a shift uh, to a monthly format here at Connected Learning TV where we'll take a deeper look at Connected Learning themes, uh, communities, uh, and topics. And so today I'd like to thank uh, the Young Adult Library Services Association, or YALSA, for being our first partner in this month, uh, revolving around uh, the topic of teens and the future of libraries. So just a few uh, quick details before we dive into our topic today. Um, to those who are watching on live stream, we encourage you to use the chat stream to introduce yourselves, uh, to connect with each other, uh, and to pose questions for those here in the Google uh, Plus Hangout. And those questions will make their way to us, and we'll try to integrate them into the flow of the conversation here today. Um, and speaking of Google+, we have a fast-growing uh, connected learning community with over 1,100 members, and we would love for you to be a part of the conversations that are taking place there. We've created a separate section within that community just for conversations about this month's topic. The link to the Google+, community should be included in the live stream chat, so please feel free to participate in that as well. The URL for our public group notes, Google Doc for today, should be included in the live stream chat. And we'd very much appreciate your assistance in capturing highlights and sharing resources related to today's conversations, uh, maybe models and examples of, of, of really interesting and creative uses of libraries and communities that you may be aware of. And that can just help build out uh, the conversation and the kinds of impacts that we'd like this conversation to have along with this monthly series. So the Google Doc will remain open to the public so we can continue uh, adding to that uh, even after today. Um, I also wanted to give everyone here in the Hangout uh, a chance just to introduce themselves. Uh, this is one of the, the great things about um, this platform is that it allows us to bring uh, you know, really interesting people who are kind of related to the topic of the theme in, in some uh, interesting kind of way. And so now we'd like to uh, just uh, allow you each uh, to introduce uh, yourselves uh, to, uh, to the webinar. And we'll start uh, with Alexandria. Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Ali Godina. Um, I'm an Outreach Services Manager at the Clearview Library District in Windsor, Colorado. Um, and basically I've always worked in kind of smaller spaces of libraries, so we've never had a teen, library, uh, teen librarian. So it's been interesting to kind of see as everyone contributes into making sure that teens have access to media and technology. Hi, I'm Kylie Larson. I'm a postdoctoral scholar at NYU's uh, Learning Networks, Ecologies, and Pathways project, and we do works on all the Macar we do work on all the MacArthur-funded sites. So that includes the Hives, the Umedias, the Quest schools. Um, my particular focus is on the Umedia experience and how teens are gaining access to digital technologies through the Umedia sites, and how that may or may not be helping close the gap in inequalities we see across sociodemographics. And I'm Marika Visser, and I work for the American Library Association's Office for Information Technology Policy. We're located in Washington, D.C. And uh, related to this topic, uh, I look at the impact of technology use in K the K-12 setting. So looking at how teens and, and young people using technology impacts their long-term learning outcomes. And uh, related, we're starting to investigate the relationship between the public library and the school library and how if you can sort of team those two entities together, um, how that can further support K-12 learning. Thank you. And I'm Renee Hobbs. I'm a, a professor and founding director of the Harrington School of Communication and Media at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I have a special interest in digital and media literacy. And these days I've been, for the last three years, working with uh, urban elementary schools looking at how school librarians and technology specialists can inter introduce uh, fundamental concepts about critical thinking about media and about media production in the context of urban elementary education. Okay, great. Um, so uh, thank you all for uh, those uh, very nice introductions and looking forward to uh, the conversations that will take place here today. Um, we're extremely happy to have Jack Martin with us in the Hangout today. 
Uh, Jack is Yalsa's current president. Um, he's worked in public libraries uh, since the age of 13 uh, and previously served at, on Yalsa's award-winning uh, board of directors from 2010 to 11 before becoming president in 2012. Um, so, Jack, we thought it might be um, a good idea if you could perhaps uh, uh, kickstart us and uh, maybe um, start off uh, by talking a bit about why it's important for school uh, and public libraries uh, to be able to offer youth regular access to digital media and what, 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 are the, what, what are some of the stakes and some of the implications associated uh, with uh, the role that libraries might play in the lives of young learners today. Sure. Thanks, Craig. Um, first of all, I'm just really excited to be uh, in the same Google Hangout with all of you fabulous people. Um, I, uh, it's, it's a real treat. So, um, so, I am, so I'm president of YALSA, and I should say that, and I, I think that Renee um, was, well, I know Renee was there, but so these conversations are coming up on the heels of, of um, YALSA's national forum on, on teen, teen and teens and libraries, which um, we had a face-to-face -face meeting uh, back in January, and basically the, the goal of that was to figure out what does young adult, what, what, do, what, what can libraries do for teenagers um, in 5, 10, 20 years? And there were a lot of really amazing conversations. And a lot of those conversations actually um, revolved around technology, which, um, we'll, which uh, Renee will remember. Um, so, you know, just to throw out a couple of, of ideas. So, so why is it important for school libraries and for public libraries to offer access to technology? So one thing is, is there are over 40 million teenagers um, in the, the country today. Um, and statistics, statistics show that um, one in four of those teenagers actually don't have access to technology, whether they can't afford it or they just don't have access to it. So that's like 10 million teenagers who can't go online or go use technology or anything. So if nothing else, that's, that's, that's an alarm call to, to, to school and public libraries who are who have always traditionally, you know, been supportive of, 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 of in-school and out-of-school learning opportunities. They're, they're bastions of information. Um, information is online now, so why, why, why wouldn't it make sense for school and public libraries to have, uh, to offer access to technology for teens? Um, and also, why wouldn't, and even in those communities where teens that might not have those at-risk risk teens or teens who may not have access, access to technology. Technology offers teenagers an opportunity to, you know, for creative outlets, for social outlets, and, and the, the realm of connected learning for all those things to come kind of crashing together to, for them to actually um, learn and create and think about what they want to do um, in their lives. Um, one other just like caveat that I want to add to this conversation is, is that, um, is that um, I, I think our today, what's exciting about today's conversation is, is about the possibilities of technology. Um, in a later chat on May 21st, we're actually going to talk about some of the challenges that libraries and librarians might face in actually um, offering technology. So um, I'm really excited about today's conversation. So thanks, Craig. Sorry, I got um, I was muted, and uh, sorry about that. Thank you, Jack, for um, for some of those initial reflections and thoughts, um, just about um, the role that, that public and school libraries might play in the lives of young people. So, so maybe um, we could uh, sort of continue um, moving forward with this conversation. Um, you know, if anyone in the hangout has some initial um, you know thoughts or data points or experiences or anecdotes that they'd like to share uh, that help to kind of further develop this theme of why libraries uh, are emerging and, and perhaps have long been uh, sort of a central uh, lo location or site in terms of young people's uh, lives as learners and their access to technology. I'm not quite sure if there are other, other, other components of this, uh, this, this issue that you'd like to contribute or at least uh, kind of put on a radar. So I'd like to open it up to the Hangout just for some initial uh, quick reactions or reflections about why you think um, libraries, both at school and also in communities, uh, can and should play a very important role uh, in the lives of young learners. Um, so I can start. Um, one, 
And uh, so I'm, I'm not in the library itself, but I talk to people, to librarians who are doing this. So my perspective is more at a, maybe a national or, you know, the policy level kind of thing. But one, one gift I think that librarians bring to the table when working with young people is that um, I think it's as people, as, as young people from elementary or on up are experimenting with technology use, whether it's I'm in a social network, I'm using Twitter, um, I'm on Reddit or whatever it is, that there's, um, it's, a, it's a really freeing, uh, freeing up kind of platform for young people to be in, but the same way that young people are experimenting face-to-face, -face, uh, you know, trying to let go a little of being young and trying to develop their personalities and who they are, they're doing that in the social networking spaces and with technology. And I, th I think that the, up that the librarians bring um, sort of that sense of mediation where this is a safe, I can provide a safe place for you to experiment. And so they're not sort of out there on their own, um, but having uh, time to interact with, um, you know, a trusted person that they have a relationship outside of the school setting. So, or outside of, maybe not the school setting because of the school librarian, but outside of sort of the more formal education setting. And I think that that's something that librarians can really build on and it's a strength. I, I agree with what um, she just said because I think even yeah. what we were hearing. No, no, thank you for that. Um, Okay. Um, just going along with what she said as well, uh, and even when we heard in last week's session, um, so much of what we're hearing is trust and having that space where teens really feel comfortable and they want to come in and be part of that. And I think librarians play such a role in mentorship um, that you don't see as much anymore um, in a lot of outside activities. Um, and I also want to just give a disclaimer for myself that um, in what I'm doing is in the libraries I work at, Fortunately or unfortunately, I'm in, um, I'm in areas that are more privileged and they don't have the same type of uh, access issues to, to media. Um, but what I'm noticing instead is we're having problems where in some of these larger libraries that are more well-funded, they don't necessarily feel we need to have technology for teens to access because they can access those things at home. And I think so much of what teens enjoy about technology is really that connected learning aspect. It's coming together. It's it's building that community. And um, so, on the opposite, on the opposite coin of the digital divide, to me is looking at regardless what your what kind of society you're living in. Um, I think it's really important that teens have access to these kind of spaces because they want to be together to build that type of community. Can I just jump on sort of what? Um sort of what Alex was just saying um, about the in terms of, about especially in terms of having access. Um, I, I know that like so many teens have access to computers or technology at home, but a lot of them don't. And um, just to kind of throw it back to libraries, I, I think that libraries have always been the place where, you know, we can all discover who we are. You know, I, I've, I've had teens discover that they are, you know, experts in Japanese literature and speaking Japanese and go to Japan uh, because they read manga. I've discover kids who um, are, are writers or who are game developers at libraries. And I, I think what's really exciting about it, and libraries have always had um, shelves of analog and paper and, and just analog collections for kids to dive into and explore where they are. But a lot of the information now is online and the information is shifted and not everybody can afford to have access to that information, whether it's through the internet, whether it's through a device or a tablet or a computer. And libraries kind of that they we, we level that playing field. We provide opportunities um, for everybody to discover who they are, and for everybody to uh, to access that information and be part of that world. And that's what's really exciting to me. Yeah. So I think that's ac absolutely right. But let me put a fly in the ointment to make this a more interesting conversation. Um, one of the great opportunities I've had this past year is the chance to be the interim director of the Library and Information Studies program here at the University of Rhode Island. So we have about 150 future librarians involved in our program and 
um, you know, like many uh, new uh, academic leaders, I'm doing a um, pretty careful survey of my students' competencies, my faculty competencies, the assets essentially that I need to develop uh, my program. And I'm seeing two really interesting gaps, and I, I want to introduce those gaps and talk a little bit about what maybe you, you have, maybe the folks on this panel or in our live stream chat have some ideas around this, because I'm finding two kinds of gaps. One is that my, many of my, uh, my, my um, library students, my library and information studies students come from across a wide range of ages. I have, of course, the 20-somethings, the 30-somethings, and the 40-somethings and then even beyond uh, of that. So they come in with a differential set of skills where some have been blogging since uh, they were 11 and others have never used WordPress. Some are really comfortable uh, with uh, social media tools like Twitter. Others really have never explored those tools. So my students come in to library education with gigantic differential skills. And the same is true of my faculty. In the United States, the average uh, university faculty is 52 years old. That means many of the library faculty, not just at the University of Rhode Island, but around the country, are themselves facing a kind of um, catch-up process around the very fast-changing uh, fast nature of these tools. One of the concerns I have is, how do we support the needs of the library faculty on their learning curve so that they can create robust learning environments for students who are learning to become librarians and information professionals? I, ha I have just a quick thought because that's actually something that we talk about all the time is that, you know, uh, we want to make sure that our librarians are out there ready to go to meet the teens where they are. And one thing I think about connected learning or incorporating technology into your learning platform is that it's a real opportunity to learn together that I am not the expert at all and that I can actually, it's okay for me to fail. It's okay for me to say, I have no idea what you're talking about. You know, that, so show me how to use, I keep saying Reddit because that's my newest thing, you know. So, so show me how to use that and what have you been doing in that space that I can then learn from and at least thinking, well, even down to elementary maybe, but at least thinking about high school, middle school age, I think that's really powerful for the student or for the young person to be to to have some knowledge that the adult does not have. And so how do we both learn from that setting? So the so the young person is now mentoring me and realizing that it's a, that they can be the expert in some instances. And I think that that's a that's a real opportunity that could be applied in public school, in public libraries and in the school library setting. Um, but I think that Renee hit on something is we want to make sure that our librarians are experiencing the technology that they're going to be expected to use while they're still in their own learning setting. Yeah, I was wondering, um, so I was, I was looking at um, an interesting report um, that was published uh, back in 2011 by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, part of the uh, U.S. Uh, Commerce Department. And so uh, the report's titled um, Exploring the Digital Nation. And one of the things that they do in the report is they begin to, um, to give us a, a, a bit more of, a, of an accurate a kind of a portrait of just the distribution of, of broadband, I mean, particularly uh, home broadband. And I think we've learned over the years, if it's from reports like this or from Pew and other, um, you know, research, that access to broadband is, is really a gateway to the kinds of digital literacy uh, opportunities and practices that I think all of us embrace and support. And we know, for example, that, that kids who, who have access to broadband in the home, they're just more, much, they're much more likely to do certain things. For example, and not only spending more time online necessarily, but more likely to make, produce, and share uh, content as opposed to young people who grow up in households uh, without broadband. And this has become a, a bit more uh, complicated because of the, uh, the, the the growing distribution of and adoption of mobile, for example. So we hear, at least in some circles, right, that mobile is bridging uh, what was once known as the digital divide. And, and so it, 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 it's a really interesting uh, kind of moment in terms of how we're thinking about the different transitions 
uh, the tensions and the opportunities that exist in young people's digital lives today. But but one point that I wanted to make from the uh, from the report is that it it, it looks at um, households without access to broadband. And then it tries to give us a sense of where members of those households are likely to go if they do not have access to broadband at home. And not surprisingly, uh, work and school, but then also libraries um, mm -hmm. emerge or rank quite high in terms of where um, household members are likely to go. And so as we begin to think about you know, the role of libraries in this kind of ever-evolving landscape, uh, and I'm particularly struck in terms of the, the, the connected learning framework and where some of that work is going, um, this this idea of, of creating spaces and opportunities for young people to to play with technology, to experiment with technology, but more importantly, to become designers, makers, and authors mm -hmm. of things that have relevance in their world. And so, uh, does anyone have any 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 thoughts or reflections about how libraries might be able to sort of function not only as a place where kids can access technology, but also access the opportunities, the community? communities, the literacies, the ecologies that support their ability to be makers and doers of things in their communities uh, that can give them a sense of fulfillment uh, and efficacy. I actually think UMedia is a really interesting example of one, ways, uh, one way that libraries can incorporate those kinds of experiences. Um, one point I want to make before I jump into that specifically is just how important it is to have this adult scaffolding. So access to technology is really important for kids. But we all know they don't come in with built-in skills. So having adults or peer supports that can help them learn how to use these technologies to become makers and creators and doers is also really, really important. So I'm glad we started off this discussion by talking about the roles of librarians and other teens in this space because that human capital or that technical or social or cultural capital, whichever capital you want to call it, is really, really important in helping them make those connections. At UMedia, what they do is um, they partner up librarians who also spend a lot of their downtime learning new skills. So I've seen in the space, for example, librarians do exactly uh, uh, what Marie, um, Marika said. Uh, they sit down and they say, okay, I don't know how to do that thing, but I'm going to find out. Or they also have access to the really great digital youth network mentors through that partnership that they've created in that space. So if they don't know how to do something like graphic design, they'll say, hey, I, I don't know how to do this, but I know I can connect you with a mentor who knows how to do this and can help you walk through that process. So they have those added in supports that not every library has, but perhaps could be brought in through volunteers. Uh, that gets a little tricky because teens really tend to form really tight connections to these adults in the space that they're working with and you know helping them learn and produce and make. Uh, so volunteer models make me a little bit nervous only because you never know how long your volunteers will be around and kids tend to really be kind of sad or upset when their their mentors have moved out of the space. So that's something uh, that we might consider is just the role of, you know, adults who are experts in their fields who can help these kids learn to go from messing around with technology to really actively making, producing, and, and learning through technology. I, I think that's a really great point and one of the things that uh, we talked about at the YALSA Teen Summit uh, that Jack talked about was um, when that happens in spaces uh, where Li li libraries and teen librarians are exploring uh, making, there's some really interesting kind of cultural tensions that can arise because um, the stuff that kids want to make often is, um, well, it's based on a lot of their interests in music and fashion and celebrity culture and that can make librarians nervous because librarians would really prefer that they make like public service announcements about books they like. Mm -hmm. And those are fun to make too. They really are. They're really fun to make. But um, sometimes that there's a perceived value. Some li some librarians can can be nervous about kids wanting to make uh, media that is uh, represents and and speaks to their their lived experience as as participants in uh, media culture. And that I I think I think that part of the um, part of the professional development experience that librarians mm -hmm. and the mentors who work in uh, youth media programs need to do is explore that trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. How kids' interest in popular culture can be mobilized toward deepening their communication skills, deepening their critical thinking skills, but also connect back to uh, discovering uh, new interests in uh, subjects they might not uh, have thought they were interested in. I think UMedia has done a great job of, of putting books in the uh, in the teen media production space, uh, seeing circulation go way, way up and discovering mm -hmm. that there's a, an, a, an on-ramp between 
kids interested in media culture, uh, kids interested in digital making, and kids interested in literacy, learning, and discovery, and the intellectual curiosity that comes when you're really engaged in a library space. I think Renee is so dead on because I was just thinking about how we were trying to do this whole digital push at our library and we bought an iPad and we bought an iPad mini and now the question is like okay now what do we do with those things mm -hmm. and so it's like well let's make a make a book trailer um, because you're sitting here trying to think of okay let's connect this to a library and how is it gonna work because we go and we go to a middle school and we do a book club with them and the middle schoolers frankly are so swamped with schoolwork and tests and that when they come to this space they want to hang out with the librarian that's there and they want to have the social atmosphere um, but they don't want to read the book so we hand out all the books to them and then they turn it back the next week and no one's read those books but then what we've noticed is by next summer when we start all over again they spent their summer time reading a lot of the books that were discussed in book club so we've kind of strayed away from the book element because it's just not working and we give them an iPad and they're off shooting these book trailers which they think are hilarious but they're more interested in the editing aspect of it mm -hmm. and our librarian doesn't know how to do that and I think that's that's an instance where we're letting them be the makers and the doers and then in turn they're teaching the librarians how how to use these type of technologies which I think is kind of a cool thing for them too to see I just love this conversation I love what because I think it's 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 just it's also connected waha waha um, but like I, I, but I love what um, Alex just brought up, and, what, and then what Renee's been talking about, um, and also what Kylie. But like I, I think the, I mean, you can't just like I mean the answer is not just to take technology and say here kids go for it. Um, it's about providing God. It's about the whole um, the, the whole adult mentor role model piece that mm -hmm. that's happening in new media, and I love that. Um, so I just, I just, just thanks for all for that. So this is a question yeah, to the that's, group. That's exactly uh, the formula. A, a question to the group that I'm curious about. Um, just thinking about the last couple of comments or so. Do you do you feel as though libraries are ready to? Because in some respects, what we're talking about here is libraries really kind of rethinking um, who they are as what they are as an institution um, and their relationship to the community, and in particular their relationship to young people what that requires in terms of infrastructure, design, organization, services. Is it your sense that libraries are poised to, to make this transition, or is this, is this still part of the conversation in which we have to further cultivate uh, the space and environment for them to feel comfortable moving in this direction? So I think that um, libraries of all types, so school libraries are having to sort of reinvent themselves and public libraries are reinventing themselves and then within the public library space, there, I think that librarians are trying to answer those very questions is what is the relationship between technology and sort of more traditional librarianship, if you will. And um, so one question that our librarians ask when we are you know, talking about this topic is we don't want the technology to to be the driver. What we want is the young people's interests or the adult interest or their needs. So coming into the library, what is it that they're asking for and how can technology facilitate that? And I think that as the, it, it's all very experimental at the moment, um, but that as people are trying things out and figuring out what makes sense, that is guiding the transition to incorporating technology use. So it's not like the newest, latest technology on the block, but it's really embedded in the services that libraries are providing. But I think it's a process. I think it depends on where the library is. I mean, all sorts of you know funding issues, whether you're embracing the technology yourself. And, and so I think libraries are sort of all over the board. I think, I think that's a really great point, Marika. And I think, in a way, what's going on right now is a uh, and, and a redefinition of the concept of literacy. So libraries have always had as a central sort of motivating drive, you know, connecting people to the, the, the power that is embedded in literacy practices. And so what's happening is the concept of literacy is expanding. And while it's expanding, I think librarians are really, remember librarians are committed to, um, 
conservation and preservation as a big part of the function of libraries. Libraries are memory institutions. We hold on to the past while we embrace the present and try to manage the future. So I think librarians are committed to holding on to a concept of literacy that is both um, respectful of print uh, culture and uh, exploring and embracing um, uh, media and, and digital culture. And that's not an easy a transition to make because, um, well, because the, the legacy of the past is so significant. And the folks who enter the field love reading, okay? Just like, you know, that's just, that's a good thing. Um, but I do think that libraries are poised to enter this new world, Craig, and that was your question. Are, are, li are librarians poised to enter this new, new world? Sure they are. And that's because librarians are passionate about delivering those skills of accessing, analyzing, composing, reflecting, and taking action in community and, and in, in ways that are responsive to community. So I think that transformation is underway, but Marika, Marika is right that it's a process. So, so we have a question from the live stream that I'd like to uh, pose to the Hangout, and, and people can respond to it as they see fit. Uh, here's the question. Um, uh, what do you do uh, when there are other groups or physical spaces in the area that offer similar services? Um, partnerships are great, uh, but they don't always happen. Um, and, um, and so it sounds to me like this person is asking, you know, there, there are other um, services, other spaces uh, that perhaps can pose a challenge to, to the role that libraries might play in this way and, and what, what might be the response uh, to, that, to that question here in the Hangout? Well, I think my immediate response would be the great thing about libraries is that everyone feels comfortable going in there usually. It may take a, a time or two for some teens turning up at the library to feel comfortable going there, but there are a lot of spaces, uh, I've talked with a lot of teens about their after school programming and where they go and where they feel comfortable. And there are a lot of spaces, at least in the city of Chicago, where teens just don't feel comfortable going. So there might be alternative spaces to what you're offering at the library that teens simply wouldn't feel comfortable going into even if they know it's a space that they might have access to. There's something about the open doors of the library where you know you can just go in and sit down and you don't necessarily have to be pushed into forced programming if you don't want to. You can just be that teens really seem to gravitate towards and to respect because they have a sense of autonomy in those spaces. So alternative or competitive spaces, you know, they might not have the same sort of freedom of movement in and out that teens like. And I think another issue is an issue of size. Um, like Chicago is significantly larger than Windsor, Colorado, where we have 18,000 people. So when we're looking at places that are already doing these kind of things, it is very much like it's, it's territory and people get upset, regardless if you're the library and we try to explain, this is not for profit, we're trying to help people, we're not charging them. I mean, people get upset. I, it just happened to me the other day. Um, and so I think it's really important, depending on the size of your community, to reach out to those different groups. Um, and whether or not you build a partnership, that, that's kind of up to you and what you feel is going to be best for your space. But I think there needs to be some sort of conversation because you don't want to be splitting your audience um, and you have these programs that you think the teens are going to absolutely love. But if they're offering a different program and they could have a whole different set of things that perhaps the library doesn't allow, then they're going to go there. And so I think it's really important to to not only know your audience, but to talk to other people that are doing these things already and figure out what isn't being done. Because um, there always is something that isn't being done. And what do the teens want to do and getting them on board with what you're having and having them have that buy-in so they want to come to you. Um, because uh, as to touch back to Renee was saying, librarians are passionate about people. And I think that's what makes a huge difference in the field and why this is the place for this kind of content to be made. Because we care, we want to be there doing this stuff with you. Um, we don't have problems that I think other places face in that aspect where, where we want to build those connections, we want to work with the teens, we'll work our night shift so we can just hang out with them. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I think, go ahead, Renee. 
Yeah, I think I, I, I just I think that's such a great point. I want to underline that one of the things I've seen looking at um, public librarians, is, especially those who are really trying to explore in this space, is that one strategy that they're using is explicitly partnering with other youth media organizations, other artists, other media professionals. They're essentially bringing people in to collaborate with, and. In the best case, in the best examples of that that I've seen, there's a real knowledge exchange where the librarian brings her or his own uh, expertise and talent and intellectual curiosity into the space along with the technology entrepreneur or the media artist or the youth media specialist. But I also have seen cases where librarians treat that as kind of like a subcontractor relationship, right? So I don't have to do the program because I've hired Joe Blow from the local media arts organization to do it. And I think that is a practice we'd like to extinguish because then the knowledge transfer doesn't happen as fully or as robustly as it can. So I think what I've been doing is trying to invite librarians to self-document and to write about their journey of discovery because when they bring a partner from the community in to develop um, maker spaces, they have an opportunity to figure out that new model that's distinctive, that could be distinctive for libraries. And I think that, as that gets, I mean, obviously at UMedia where there's tons of resources and money, it's, it's a little easier to imagine that, but in, low, in the low funding environment that, you know, we're working here in Providence, Rhode Island, um, we have to be creative, <laughs> right? And I think in some ways we have to kind of self-document some of the practices that are working as well as the practices that are not working and uh, treating media artists like vendors or subcontractors is a, is not a good strategy. We have to name it, we have to recognize it, and we have to try to resist it. Definitely, because I think when they walk away, then who becomes the professional? Who are they going to come back and ask? And when you don't know, that doesn't send a great message. I think it's really important. Well, I think it's. But, I think it's but interesting to be, that... and that's really true. But but to be honest, the reason why it happens is because there's so few librarians in those spaces, and they are overworked, and they're responsible for the reference desk and this and that and the other thing, and they have to run the youth programs at the same time. So sometimes the staffing is just not as there's just not enough time for librarians to do what they what they need to do well. And also, I just just again to sort of connect the dots. Between... So what are the and Go ahead, Jeff. About what Renee was ahead, saying about the, sure. I thought one of the things I thought that was Renee was saying about sort of like the shift, um, the sort of been, you know, the a place where literacy is celebrated. It's part of our mission, and that's changing. And so libraries are trying. Libraries are now trying to rethink and redefine where they are and what they are. So when we think about bringing in these these collaborations, or we think about um, bringing in these partners, whether they're and bringing in mentors, um, I think we ha um, I, I, we have to be really careful because um, we have to figure out like where do, where do, where do these collaborators and where do these outside partners where do they fit in inside of the library mission? And I think that's really hard to figure out right now because the missions of libraries are kind of changing right now. They're in flux. Um, it's exciting, but it's also kind of challenging. Um, I think like finding that sweet spot between. Um, What's happening in the outside? You know, you know, bringing in those outside collaborators or partners, and figuring out what the library is doing and what the library wants. That's like if you can, if you can figure out that formula, that's 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 big stuff. You know, so one of the things that we often hear, um, and I think this is what you media has been uh, quite effective at responding to, is you know, libraries have not always been regarded, uh, at least through the eyes of young people, as hospitable spaces. Um, spaces that are, you know, yes spaces as opposed to, you know, no, shh, be quiet, you know, those kinds of spaces. And, you know, as we think about connected learning and, and the vision of connected learning, there is a, a, a real commitment to the issue of, of equity. Um, and I think a lot of us sort of recognize that when we think about equity in the world today, uh, if it's digital equity, if it's you know, in terms of educational equity, uh, economics, um, how do we begin to um, think about uh, how libraries factor into this equity challenge that teens, um, particularly youth who are coming from resource poor schools and communities, um, you know, how do how do libraries become a, a space, an opportunity, a resource to deal with these various gaps, achievement gaps, equity gaps, uh, civic opportunity gaps? Um, 
any ideas about the role that libraries might play in terms of um, you know beginning to address some of those equity concerns? So I think that um, in many instances, and and I th in this initial uh, when we were getting ready for the hangout, the question was talking about urban libraries. But I would also posit that rural libraries fill that same equity gap, and that um, it's you know we know about sixty percent or so of of public libraries are in their community the only free access to technology and the internet. Um, and so it's it does bridge that digital divide gap that is very much still alive. Um, we know also that uh, that uh, even if the internet is available, there's you know about a third of the population that doesn't take broadband at home for various reasons. A lot of it has to do with the library issue around digital literacy being fearful. Certainly there's cost issues um, and that the library has a real opportunity here to even out that space. So if, you're, if your only access is in school or um, you know with a mobile device even, which I, I know that there's some controversy over whether mobile is equal to um, the hardwire connection. Uh, so I think that libraries also because they have that what we're calling the trusted individual who um, is there all the time um, to sort of facilitate the learning that goes on. Um, this is a space that is something unique about libraries in the community. Um, there are other youth groups obviously that, that work with, with young people but um, it, the doors of the library are open to all regardless of whether you belong to this club or you belong to that club and again the no fee part is is huge and I know that more and more libraries are providing the you know the actual technology just not the not just the internet access so in conjunction those two things I think it's a really powerful moment um, and I, I have a question for maybe people in the chat or, or um, people in the hangout is about the relationship between the K-12 library and the public library in this space it's about how there are where are the opportunities for collaboration around that digital divide sort of equity question <laughs> I feel like Kylie might have more to say on this subject than I will in terms of rural libraries, but I know for where we live, it's not even a matter of connection. I mean, you straight up can't get service. So yeah. we have a bookmobile, and so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the manager of the bookmobile, and the whole thing we wanted to do was, was to close that divide. So we stocked up the bookmobiles with laptops and the iPads so that way people could have internet access, but we go out there with our MiFi cards or anything else. and. 90% of the time, our entire hour is spent trying to connect to the internet. <laughs> um, and, and it isn't fun, and it's not fun for yeah. us, it's not fun for the people there, so we're at least able to bring them the books on the bookmobile, but even when we're trying to get the technology to them, if there isn't a tower, we're not going to get the service. Right. And I think that's a right. whole other issue, you know, that we're facing. Um, and then just in those types of situations, the library is 35, 40 minutes away. Uh, so the school libraries become that central location, and if you don't have either a school librarian in a lot of those K-12 through schools, then where do you go, or what do you do, or if they don't want to let you in into those kind of spaces? Yeah, I'm really interested in that because librarians have to be so creative in the way they um, move forward in this space, and I was especially interested in the live stream chat right now. Elise just posted an interesting... Um, a note about libraries um, beginning to charge for special programs in digital literacy because of course in other community other community organizations youth media organizations and other organizations actually you know these are fee based programs and I'm curious about you know how this panel responds to that is that a strategy or solution that we would want to encourage robust experimentation with in the teen library arena or is that something we feel skeptical or critical about uh, would you be supportive of a fee-based program that would be a summer program for instance for teens to learn digital literacy skills or 
or should we avoid or resist uh, fee-based programs in this arena when it comes to uh, public and or school libraries? What are your thoughts on that? The idea of libraries and fees just makes me recoil almost instantaneously, and I'm not really sure why. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious why you Agreed. think a library is a very equitable space, right? Like, kids can come there, they don't have to pay, that's the whole point of a library. It's a public good that we all have access to, so that makes me really uncomfortable. Uh, some of my other work also is on the learning labs that MacArthur is funding, and a lot of them are partnerships between museums and libraries, and they're having this exact same issue where the museums are feeling like we really need to be charging for these services, especially if we're going to house these programs in our institutions, and the librarians, I mean, it's very much ingrained in them that no, we do not charge fees for these kinds of educational public good services that we're offering. So it's a larger struggle that's going on across all of these collaborative sites. Yeah, it seems to run run counter to what we know to be some of the barriers in terms of learning that happens outside of, of, of school, for example. And I mean, there's this really interesting uh, data that's been coming out over the last few years or so about this widening um, enrichment opportunity gap. And so we know that college-educated parents, high-income uh, parents, are investing in their kids out of school learning lives uh, at a much higher rate than um, than low-income parents. And so there's this sort of widening gap in terms of access to camps and access to, um, you know, tutoring and mentoring and, and, and sports activities, uh, the fine arts, whatever it might be. And so it seems to me, right, that, that historically, as we think about the role that public libraries have played in communities, that, that maybe one of the roles among many is perhaps being um, a space or a resource where this enrichment opportunity gap may be at least close to some degree, particularly in the summer, right? We also know that low-income kids are much more likely to fall further behind academically over the summer than their middle and higher income counterparts. So the idea of charging uh, for access to these kinds of opportunities in libraries seem to run counter to things that we've learned, uh, what we know the challenges are, uh, and what the barriers are to perhaps creating more equitable uh, kinds of learning opportunities. Yeah, I totally agree with that, except, you know, I think that, you know, this is the challenge around the ideal and the real, right? So I ran a summer program for children ages 5 to 13 for three years in an urban school in Philadelphia, and thanks to grant funding, uh, that program was, uh, you know, essentially all practically fee-less. There was a very modest, uh, small, small fee. We had widespread participation from... Uh, children from 41 different neighborhoods in Philadelphia. Uh, but when that grant funding runs out, that program goes away. And I, I do feel like libraries are increasingly struggling with the fact that they do not have the funding to subsidize a summer program for teens and they want to provide those services. And again, what are the funding models apart from the philanthropies? Uh, to support this work and how and or how do we build this into the infrastructure of services that we provide as a routine part of service. I feel like that's the place of innovation that libraries have to move into in the next iteration of this work. Uh, one thing that we talk about a lot and and maybe uh, I don't have all the details about the U Media, but is um, building sort of the best practices where, Renee, you're absolutely right, without the money it's hard to talk about exactly what you can, can and can't do, but um, can you scale a U Media project down to something manageable for a small library or a library that's picking how to spend its budget? Um, and what kinds of communities of practice are there out there that librarians can take advantage of to understand what they could then try themselves with a limited budget, not a grant-funded uh, budget? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things the Learning Labs are struggling with. Mm -hmm. um, because while they have MacArthur planning grants, once those planning grants are done, they have to figure out sustainability plans uh, in and of themselves. And that's been a sticking point for a lot of the organizations and that's something that our research team will be documenting so hopefully we'll be able to share out which sustainability plans end up being feasible for the long term and which sort of crumble and don't last. So we're hoping we can shed some light on that. I don't really have good data for you right now. I know that lots of these sites are considering partnerships with um, corporate organizations in their respective cities to get some sponsorship for different programs they'd like to, they'd like to offer, especially tech companies. 
that might not be an option, especially for rural libraries or for smaller cities. But that's one model that some people are considering. But it's mm -hmm. yeah, it really is an ongoing challenge, and I'm really glad that Renee brought up that that point because the realistic versus the idealistic is always a challenge. <laughs> And one thing that we talk about is how you can show to potential funders. So like in a small, in a more rural or uh, area, your local foundations. I mean, they're all about economic development and uh, keeping youth in the area, not leaving when they go to college, uh, having them come back home. And so how can we, as a profession, I think, show the impact of having a library technology center and youth coming in and learning how to collaborate and, and developing skills that are marketable um, so that when they graduate and go on to higher education or if they go directly into the job market that they're bringing real dollars back into the community and and I mean that's maybe not how we like to talk about it we like to talk about all the great learning that goes on but if you can show this economic value piece I think that that um, can go a long way to having your library board or whoever your governing body is say yeah you know we need to dedicate some of our funding to this particular project or purpose not easy but there's yeah, and, and I guess I'm not I mean I just just, just to add is that, I mean, I, I, I guess what I was trying to suggest earlier about this enrichment opportunity gap is, I don't just, I mean, I certainly understand the need to be more creative in terms of how you fund and, and support these kinds of uh, services and opportunities in libraries, but but I don't, I wouldn't necessarily reduce it to, to being idealistic. In, in fact, it is, it's, it's, it's quite realistic that many families simply would not be able to uh, afford these kinds of enrichment opportunities if there were fees attached to them, if they had to come out of their pocket to pay for, uh, for these kinds of services and opportunities. Some certainly, but as we've seen, I mean, I'm just thinking about the communities and families and, and students that we've worked with uh, here in the Central Texas area. And, and it would, I think it would be virtually impossible for a lot of those kids coming from immigrant households, single parent households, low income households uh, to, um, to, to, to gain access to these opportunities uh, if they had to if they had to pay for them. Oh yeah, so, that's that's absolutely I, I, true, Craig. But I think I, I, so, so, I, so I think it's an interesting challenge. But I I think all I'm saying is it's not so much being idealistic as being realistic about the fact that if we don't figure out creative ways to make these services available. Particularly to the young people who need them the most, uh, they simply won't be able to access them. That doesn't mean that we we, we can't be creative or innovative in terms of how we fund them, uh, but it's, I, I don't think it's necessarily idealistic. Yeah, I think that's a really great point, and I think one of the things it takes us back to the broadband question, Craig, though, which you brought up at the very beginning, and I think is really interesting. One of the conversations that happened uh, at Jack's event earlier this spring at the Yalsa Teens uh, and Libra Libraries Summit. Uh, one of the, the interesting tensions that emerged, a conversation that was, I thought, very rich and provocative was, um, of course, librarians want everyone to have access, right? And so who can be opposed to increasing broadband access to everybody? Like, that's like, that's like apple pie, right? You, everyone loves that, right? That's a good thing, right? Um, but there was some concern that, uh, you know, we, with the Connect to Compete and the other sort of federally subsidized broadband programs that basically give large cable and telecommunications companies subsidies to um, provide low-cost internet access to urban communities and rural communities, um, some sense that librarians had some fear that that would actually reduce the demand for getting broadband access through the library, right, where you might actually get access to programs and digital literacy training and contact with other people who can support you with that elbow to elbow peer to peer learning that you media provides and so if everyone has access to broadband in the home and and everyone has if everyone has access to broadband in the home then it, it's possible that the, the 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 gap at least in terms of the skills gap would not be ameliorated it would widen because if you're using if you're using broadband in the home, you're doing what you're doing what you've always done, right? You're you're texting, you're you're downloading music videos or whatever. When you when you come to the library to get your broadband, you're surrounded by people who are doing really cool things that are different than what you already know how to do, and you have an opportunity to learn more. So I thought that tension has to be recognized as we want to support access, but we want to realize libraries play a really important 
plays not just a stopgap, but a really important educational space for people in uh, who, who lack the digital literacy skills. And just yeah. to follow up really quick on what Renee said, um, I think I think yes, apple pie. I want apple pie. Everyone wants apple pie, and I think then we need to also continue to take it that one step further and make sure we're doing the outreach to then bring those people back into the library. I mean, it isn't we figure out how to bring these technologies, we figure out how to close this digital divide, and that's it. I, I, the game's never over. You know, that's where we figure out how to bring them back into the library. So, so we, we're approaching um, kind of the end here. Um, I thought I may go to um, a, a question that was generated uh, prior to, um, to the beginning of the session. And let me just send it to you and, and, and just maybe a real quick response or an example from those of you who, uh, who may have one to share. And the question is, what positive stories or examples uh, can we share with our community about how digital media access opened up learning uh, and or other kinds of opportunities, economic opportunities, uh, civic opportunities uh, for teens uh, that you might want to share? I have a, a, a short story, I guess, um, where in at least in some of the public schools that I'm familiar with, um, the school day is very, uh, very much timed. So the kids are going minute to minute from activity to activity, and it's all about the the product and less about the process of learning. And that I think um, what can be very powerful about these you media spaces or just having a time to mess around is that it's it's just a time to experiment. And I um, I was in a you media center in in Miami actually, and there were just some kids who were um, you know they were sitting typical teenager kind of thing, um, and but what they were doing where they were putting a story about um, uh, an older gentleman in the neighborhood and they had made up part of it but they had interviewed him and they had some clips, some still photos and they had some video and then they had some um, you know they had talked to him and interviewed him so they had that whatever I'm losing the term but that piece of, of media and they were putting it into a rap thing and so it was and they were so into it they were not even really paying attention that there were that there was an audience of several people sort of watching them do it and I I, I looked at the contextual learning that was going on so it wasn't that flat assessment that the, the end product um, was not Almost, almost not as important as the whole process that they had gone through and they would have a very nice end product as a result but I kept thinking of all of the layers that were that they were going through um, in that one experience and I got the impression that that was happening across the board in the center you know I was looking at this one group, two two kids um, so Yeah, I mean, we see this a lot at U Media. So kids, they have these scaffolded experiences because of their access to adults in this space and to mentors in this space. And you'll see kids who come in who don't understand even how to use Apple computers. And that's what the space is generally populated with. And so they'll sit down and they'll start messing around with them and then they'll get stuck. And then they'll go grab a mentor and then the mentor will teach them how to use it. And then they'll, you know, I'll do an interview with them like a week later and they'll say things like, I had no idea how to do that until someone helped me. Now it makes so much more sense, and now I, I can understand how to do all of these other things because I learned that very basic, like how to click and how to open files appropriately or something really basic that we all think that teams would know how to do automatically. We also have really fun stories from your media of kids being exposed to anime or to um, graphic design or to movie filming, filmmaking. And there's several stories of kids who went on to actually go to college for those things because they were exposed to them at UMedia and they developed those skills and they felt confident enough that they could take what they learned at UMedia and then apply it in a college setting and they wouldn't have to feel like they were behind uh, the other kids who might have had experiences at home or who had parents who were creatives who could, you know, make those connections and those links for them. So, yeah, that's a pretty common thing that happens at UMedia. I wouldn't say it's the, the main story that all kids experience while they're there. I'd say there's a solid 10 to 15 percent of kids who have that kind of really connected learning experience where they're exposed to digital technologies. They take those skills and really run with them and apply them in a more academic setting or towards a career in the future. And then there's just a, a whole host of kids who come and explore and have a good time and maybe they make something, maybe they don't make something. 
but it's that social experience they have in the space that creates a sense of belonging that really, really matters to them. So even when it maybe doesn't translate into a more career-based or economic opportunity, that social belongingness is a really important thing. Okay, um, thank you um, everyone for um, a really uh, fast-paced um, hour. It's amazing how quickly uh, time flies. Um, I guess it's true, it really does fly when you're having fun. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really um, just appreciative of the opportunity to be here uh, with each of you and uh, your contributions, your work. I think are so important uh, to these issues and to this question of, of libraries. Um, so I want to encourage everyone to keep uh, this conversation going by using the Twitter hashtag. Um, it's hashtag a future of libraries and posting in the Connected Learning Google uh, Plus community. Um, by this afternoon, we'll have a full recording of this webinar and other curated content up on www.connectedlearning.tv uh, that you can share with uh, your network. So please uh, feel free to do that. If you'd like to stay up to date on all the events and conversations happening throughout the month, uh, please go to www.connectedlearning.tv and sign up for this month's uh, newsletter. Uh, this coming Tuesday, May 14th, uh, join us here on live stream again, uh, 10, 10 to 11 a.m. Pacific time, as we tackle our second subtopic of the month, uh, the best practices when, when it comes to incorporating digital and social media into libraries. So here, I think we talked about some of the, just the some of the visions, some of the challenges, uh, what's at stake, uh, and next week we'll uh, focus on some of the best practices uh, and what's actually happening uh, in and around libraries around the country. So again, thank you everyone uh, for your participation, uh, and we hope to collaborate more with you uh, throughout the month on this great uh, uh, opportunity. Have a good day.